This presentation that you're watching is called Fallen Angels, Rise of the Nephilim. What I'm holding in my hand right here is a serpent idol. These are found in the area all around where ancient Eridu was, in current day Iraq, where the Tower of Babel, the areas where the Tower of Babel was, where you also find a lot of what are called eye temples. A portion of the reason that they're called eye temples is you find all of these little wispy, ghost, E.T. looking characters, supernatural characters that have all of these little eyes on them. These little eye idols. This particular idol is a serpent goddess. Its name would be Namu or the, or the Tiamat, one of the oldest forms of worship on earth, the Nakash in the garden. The word Nakash has three uses in one, just as the Nakash comes from Genesis 3. As a noun, it means serpent. That's where you're getting the common translation in the book of Genesis that this was just a, a serpent in the garden. But it's much more than that because as a verb, it means this serpent, just like this idol here, means to be divine is what it means. Now as an adjective, it means the shining one. So this character that we're finding in the book of Genesis in chapter 3 is a luminous serpentine creature seeming angelic and wise yet evil. Therefore, it would only be appropriate for us to begin coming from Genesis 3 where the serpent makes entrance, going to the passages of Genesis 6 where it reads this, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God, the word there is B'nai Ha Elohim. This means a direct creation of God. These are angels. The sons of God, these are fallen angels in this context, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with mankind forever, for they are mortal, and their days will be a hundred and twenty years. Now, whether you're using the text of Genesis or this little replica that I have here of the Sumerian King's List or any of these other documents, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, they're talking about in the ancient past, they're talking about they're stating that over time you have been losing things, which is the reverse of what is commonly taught, that you are declining over time, that everything here, that you've gone from a lush pre-flood world to a very diminished and reduced state. So right at the beginning of this, I'd like to present you these two skulls. These are both museum quality replicas of skulls. So this one that's in my hand right here, this is a replica of a modern human skull is what this is. And I'm gonna turn it a couple of different directions for you. On this side next to me, pull that in the screen just a little more, that is what's called a Neanderthal skull. Now I'm gonna remove the bottom jaw from this modern human skull right here that I'm holding and I'm going to remove the bottom jaw of this skull on this side. I'm going to hold both of these skulls up for you. This is the modern human skull. I want you to look at those rinky dink little teeth that are on that skull right there. Now I want you to look at how thick those teeth are on that Neanderthal, this ancient skull right here in my hand, this ancient human skull. Those teeth right there, let me ask you, could those teeth and that bone structure on this skull last for many hundreds of years? Whereas this skull looks pretty rinky-dink and like it would fall apart pretty fast by comparison. Ancient skull, modern skull. Now as I set these skulls down on this desk here, I would like to share with you also that whether you're looking at the pages of Genesis, whether you're looking at the pages of Genesis, or whether you're looking at the Epic of Gilgamesh, or the Sumerian Kings List, all of these documents going back to the earliest time frames of recorded history are telling you about the Flood, they're telling you about very strange events, supernatural events 
on all of these texts and they're telling you about extraordinarily long lifespans. Now both Genesis 6 as well as the book of Enoch chapter 6 are covering strangely, interestingly, the same events. These events of the, the fall of the angels. And those events, 200 angels came down, they swore an oath, and they made entrance on Mount Hermon. Right here behind me, this actually comes out of our three-part Genesis series, our books, Nimrod, Pre-Flood, and Exodus, A God in a Nutshell. This would be page 16 of one of the books. Behind me on the screen here, what you're looking at, this is called Pan's Cave right here. There's an altar, what appears to be an ancient altar, right inside the heart of this cave, which has the, the stone of that cave, looks like the devil's mouth itself. It's got that demonic look to it surrounding the cave. They would do child sacrifice within that cave to the god, to the god Pan, seen right over here. There was a stone memorial. This is an image of it right here. It was found on top of the mountain. There's a translation of it on this side, Mount Hermon. By order of the Most High and Holy God, those who swear an oath proceed from here. Now, the God being referred to, the translation I'm using for this comes from my friend Derek Gilbert. I would highly recommend his work. The God being referred to on this tablet is most probably the god Baal, more specifically Baal Hermon is who's being referenced. The text of Genesis in chapter 6 continues. In verse 4 we read, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, this means before and after the flood, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Nephilim is kind of a basket umbrella term. These are, these are the product of the fallen angels and the women producing offspring of all sorts of various kinds often being referred to as giants, but you've got a garden array of very strange things on this planet, some of which we'll touch on in a few minutes. And also afterwards, meaning after the flood, when the sons of God, again the translation there would be Beneha Elohim, this specifically means the angels, went into the daughters of men and had children by them. These were the heroes of old, the men of renown, I would like to I'd like to state very firmly at this part that whether you're looking at the epic of Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, they were referring to these beings, these strange characters, which you find strange artifacts and skulls, particularly at ritual sites. Many of them come from South America, but you find strange artifacts all over this earth very similar to what is sounds like being recorded on these ancient stones like for example Gilgamesh. To get a clear glimpse of these events in detail I'd like to dive us into the book of Enoch. Sections of what you're about to watch come from our film set actually from our Genesis series the Vav part one and specifically the clips you're about to watch come from the extended version of the Vav part two. That's nearly a, that's roughly a two hour and it's not roughly it is, a two hour and 55 minute film. And I come over to the book of Enoch, chapter 106, being that they so badly in those worlds after that flood wanted their sun gods, their Prometheus, best known for defying the gods. This could be the story of Lucifer, could be the story of one third of the angels that fell, or it could be the story of one of the three brothers that fell, who took on the personification of a sun god. After all, the Prometheus is best known for defying the gods by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity in the form of technology, knowledge, and civilization. Only he didn't do that. He even held back the calendar from his own sons so that he could be the sun god. That's what he did. That's the truth of the matter. But what was he? He was a crafty trickster to the Greeks and Romans, but also the light bearer coming forth to 
birth those first civilizations of all earth. Well, perhaps the author of these stones, looking at all of these fallen angels and beings, if that be him, one of the three, on his own rocks, forgot the story of his father, the 10th number of completion, the 10th from Adam, Noah, meaning rest or comfort. The story given by Enoch in his line, the seventh from Adam. And being that the author of these stones is also the birther, Egypt and Babylon, of all the mystery religions on earth, perhaps he also forgot that Enoch went into those fallen angels and said, the Lord God of heavens bears a message for you. You thought you knew secrets. Little did you know you only knew the worthless ones. And perhaps even beginning in the days of Ham's son, Utu's son, Cush, Meshki and Gasher, who took off on a boat, perhaps to brand the image of the sun god in the temples to the moon all across the Americas and jungles of the ancient world, where they would worship as royalty and kings, anything strange. Well, before that time, in the time of that pre-flood world, when Enoch went in into the temples of Semyaza and Azazel, the two heads of the 200 angels who had fallen upon Mount Hermon, the base of which is the cave they would give child sacrifice to the god Pan. And Enoch said to those angels, the Lord God of the heavens, has said you should intercede for men and not men for you. Behold, a heavy sentence has gone forth to put thee in bonds. Never again shall ye return into the heavens for all eternity. It was then, according to the text, that big, tough, fallen angels tore their clothes and wailed and screamed in their dark torchlit halls and Uriel said to me here shall stand the angels that have connected themselves with the women and their spirits assuming different forms are defiling mankind as sun gods and moon gods through the ages and hours of history and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as their gods. That's what the text states. Here they shall stand until the day of the great judgment. God's been talking about this since the beginning of the book, where they will be judged and made an end of. And the women also of the angels, the women that combined with the angels who went astray, shall become as sirens. And I, Enoch, saw the vision and the end of all things. No man shall see as I have seen. Ah, but wait. Enoch 81, and Uriel said unto me, Observe, Enoch, these heavenly tablets. Uh-oh. Would these possibly be the same tablets? of destiny and those that decide destinies of the righteous that Utu, dear, dear Utu, was talking about to his sons, that he claimed his Abkelu conjurer's hand? I think not. Or are these the tablets that Moses spoke of when he was on top of the mountain being told by the tongue of Enoch to his children that Utu, the first sun god of earth, wished he could get back to. These documents were on the boat, I'll tell you that right now. Observe ye, Enoch, these heavenly tablets, and read what is written thereon, and mark every individual fact. And I mean the words of Enoch, the actual scrolls of Enoch, the book of Enoch was on board the boat, not the heavenly tablets that he's recording and telling his sons about. 
Just wanted to clarify that. And I observed the heavenly tablets and read everything which was written thereon and understood everything and read the book of the deeds of all mankind, the book of the living. And of all the children of flesh that there shall be upon the earth to the remotest of generations. And therewith I blessed the great Lord and King of glory forever and ever, in that he has made all the works of the world. The demons would claw in their clothes and give anything to have their name written one time in that book. And I extolled the Lord because of his patience and blessed him because of the children of men. And after that, I said, blessed is the man who dies in righteousness. Noah was called the righteous, even on all these pagan stones, even by the God of the air in Lil, that ran with Utu from the mountains. It was the righteous who decide destinies, was it not, of whom he spoke? Blessed is the one that dies in righteousness and goodness, concerning whom there is no book of unrighteousness written, and against whom no day of judgment shall be found. These words were on the boat with Noah. And those seven holy ones, wait, had, had Utu created seven dark ones? Seven dark ones, seven dark Apkelu, which doctor conjures, the same as Nimrod had in his court, with Anaki as their head, who would birth all the children of abomination? What are we copying here? These seven holy ones brought me and placed me at the door of my house and said to me, declare everything to thy son Methuselah and show to all thy children that no flesh is righteous in the sight of the Lord, for he is their creator. One year we will leave thee with thy son till thou givest thy last commands, that thou may teach thy children. These records we give you now, that you may share them, these words, on that boat with all the generations of the world. In his 600th year, and much has happened, his father, Lamech, passed away five years before, and his grandfather, Methuselah. Now, Methuselah's name means his death shall bring. Methuselah, his name means his death shall bring, or his death shall bring the judgment. Died in the past year, so the year of the flood, Methuselah had died, or seven days before the flood. Died at the age of 969. Methuselah was the longest living man in the text. But if I come from Adam down to Noah, actually Noah's father, Lamech, in the book of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and being that they all went to such lengths to birth even their empires all the way to the Romans and their, and their sun gods, beginning with Utu and to defeat that true son of God and put the crown of thorns on his head. And in Utu's case, old Utu thrown from the two mountain peaks to impersonate a claimed sun god. Well, surely, in that case, leading all the way to these, they perhaps knew this story from Enoch, who they also twisted. And here we go, Enoch, chapter 106. And after some days, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech. Here's Methuselah, right here. He's the longest living man in your biblical text at 969 years. His name means his death shall bring or his death shall bring the judgment. His son is Lamech, whose son would be Noah. 
Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech, and she became pregnant by him and bore a son. And his body was white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool, and his eyes were beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun. And the whole house was very bright, and thereupon he arose, this child arose in the hands of the midwife. And he opened his mouth, and he conversed with the Lord of Righteousness. Who is this? And his father, Lamech, was afraid of him, and fled the house. And he went to his father, Methuselah, and he said unto him, For I have begotten a very strange son, diverse from an unlike man, and resembling perhaps the sons of God of heaven, the angels, the Bnei Ha Elohim is what he's stating. And his nature is different, and he is not like us, and his eyes are as the rays of the sun, and his countenance is glorious. And it seems to me that he is not sprung from me, but from the angels. And I fear that in his days a great work, a great wonder, a great fear may be wrought upon the earth. And now, my father, I am here to petition thee and implore thee that thou mayest go to Enoch, our father, and learn from him the truth. For his dwelling place, Enoch's dwelling place, is amongst the angels. Enoch never actually died in your text. Enoch was not, for God took him. And his son was Methuselah, and Methuselah went. And then it states here, and I, and by the way, the book of Enoch, as it gets down into it, is actually, there are portions even of excerpts of Noah. It's more like a family record. And in my belief, it would have been kept on that boat. But no matter what you believe, here's what it reads next. And I, Enoch, answered and said unto him, Methuselah, the Lord will do a new thing on the earth. And this I have already seen in a vision and make known to thee that in the generation of my father, Yerit, some of the angels did go astray. They transgressed the word of the Lord. And behold, they have united themselves with women on the earth and have committed a great sin with them. And some of the angels have married some of the women of earth and have begotten children by them. And they shall produce on the earth giants, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. And there shall come a great punishment on the earth. And the earth shall be cleansed from all impurity. Enoch continues, Yea, indeed, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth. And there shall be a great deluge, that means a flood, and a great and mighty destruction for one year on the earth. Yet this son, who has been born unto you, shall be left on the earth, and his three children shall be saved with him, when all mankind that are on the earth shall perish, shall die in this flood. He, this one that converses with the Lord of heaven, and his three sons shall be saved. And now go and make known to thy son the boat as far as the eye could see in this direction in this direction and they
inside of the Ark. This is the enormous door to, to Noah's Ark, right here in front of us. So, and it looks like a large door, but this ship had three, three layers. So you had the top, you had the middle, and you had the bottom. And this is where the, they, they would enter. And it says that it was God himself who closed the doors to this boat. And it says that the animals, they didn't come two by two. They were literally surrounding the boat as far as the eye could see. And as the floodwaters began to come down, all of the men of earth that knew what Noah had been building and the animals were loaded two by two onto the ark. But as they came inward, and then the waters began to come down. The waters began to come down. And the men, the men that was surrounded, the men that had called Noah, they called him a fool for 120 years. He had preached to them. He had preached to them, saying one day it's going to rain, it's going to flood, it's going to pour, it's going to drown all of you. The judgment of God is coming and it's going to drown all of you. And for 120 years he told them this. He would go in and he would tell them this. But then on the day that the rain began to come, began to come down, and the earth began to shake, and spouts were coming up this way and that, that boat was in the center of a continent. And they could feel the water beginning to come in and beginning to cover the feet. And they came up towards, towards the boat, towards the boat, and they screamed to Noah, who was up there in those windows, in those top windows with his family. They yelled upwards to the, the windows, that are at the top of the ark. And Noah came and he appeared at the windows on the top. And they were screaming as the waters became heavier and heavier. And they said, let us on board. Let us on board. We're going to die out here. There's the earth just literally splitting open and the waters just rushing forth. And on the 17th day of the second month, 17th day of the second month, of Noah's 600th year, the 600th year of Noah's life, the waters of the great deep and all the waters from the sky let loose upon the earth. This behind me on the screen is called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. It encircles the earth like the seam on a baseball. It's what separates your continents. It is a 40,000 mile mountainous crack on the ocean floor. It is the place where the hot searing water, even this day, came searing forth. Coming forth, like on the diagram behind me, if you were anywhere near the edges of it, it would have vaporized you. If you were on the edges or the poles, it would go up so high that water into space, it would come down as ice, trapping animals in ice cubes, like your frozen mammoths. Creating, of course, the layers of strata that you find underneath the ground. A word which means sedimentary rock is what the strata is made out of. A word which literally means rock laid down by water. It's sorted by weights and densities. The animals trapped inside that strata on the day of the flood are sorted by ecological systems. Commonly, they are compared in your universities to tree rings. I'd like to point out that it is not tree rings. It is, in fact, it's dirt. And Noah looked down to them and he said, where were your fears 120 years ago when I told you that this day would come? You're not getting on board this boat. And at that moment, as the floodwaters rushed inward, and they screamed up and they said, storm the boat. And they ran inwards like a wild horde. And that's where it says in the text that the animals that surrounded the boat, they kicked outward in a violent horde. And water went every direction as they fought to get inside. And Noah looked down and he said, you're not getting on this boat. And that's where it reads in the text that God shut the doors to the vessel and it was at that moment as they fought forward to come inwards the animals kicking outward in every direction that it says the rage of the flood waters came rushing in and it was then that the boat began to lift upwards the entire boat began to lift upwards and as those waters began to crash in and the boat began 
lifting up, it began violently spiraling upwards as if every board were about to shake loose and break. And as the boat was spinning upwards, Noah gripping on with his family. And it says in the text that in those moments, every animal on board cried out in its own tongue. And Noah gripping on with his family as the boat rocked and shook. He said, Lord, would you remember us? Would you remember me, your servant? And at that point, it reads that the boat rested peacefully atop the waters. And it's in Genesis 9, the tet symbolizes a basket. Could be something good in there, could be something evil in there. Same chapter as the split up of the three sons. God sent a rainbow as a sign that he would never flood the entire earth again. It's another symbol or sign. It's been taken and been twisted. But later in Genesis 9, you have the directions and the bloodlines of the three sons. One path going down, and one path going up from the lineage of Noah and Shem or Hashem coming all the way through these generations right here all the way down to Abraham and through Abraham you would get a great promise that through the seed of Abraham God would bring blessing to all the generations and peoples of the world. Abraham's son would be Isaac, and Isaac's two sons would be Esau and Jacob. And Jacob's name would be changed, changed to, to Israel. And Israel would have 12 sons. And one of those sons, Joseph, would be sold into the slavery of Egypt which would last a time frame from Abraham of roughly 400 years. My name is Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell. I want to thank you very much for watching this presentation on fallen angels and the rise of the Nephilim. It's my very strong opinion, just like the biblical text, as well as all of these ancient stones going back to the very beginning, that the demonic is absolutely more than real. Let me be very clear that God is also real and he is far larger than all of these pesky little things. This film is dedicated as well as all the films by God in a nutshell to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Roughly 20 minutes of the film that you just watched actually comes out of our film The Vav Part 2, the extended version found over in the Partners section on the God in a Nutshell website. That particular film, The Vav Part 2, is roughly three hours long. The Vav Part 1, which is the film right here seen behind me, is the first of the two of the Vav films found over on God in a Nutshell. These films have both a regular version, which is what you're looking at, as well as an extended version, which will look like this. The extended version of that film, and I would recommend that you watch both of them in their extended versions. I believe they're incredible films, and you're going to have a <laughs> a real journey watching them. The extended version of the Vod Part 1 I believe is roughly 3 hours and 15 minutes. And those two films are merely just the ending part of our Genesis series which goes all the way from the, the pre-flood world all the way through those Vav films and now we also have and that Genesis series took me several several years just to come well it's actually taken over a decade really to research but took several years just to put those films together leading all the way through those Vavs and again each one is the Vav films themselves are roughly three hours in length each. 
Behind me on the screen is The Rise of Joseph. There is an array of films over at GodInTheNutshell.com. I want to thank you for watching our Genesis series. And also thank you for subscribing to any of our materials and for just enjoying the films like this one that you just watched, Fallen Angels and the Rise of the Nephilim. These are the, the books that I'm holding in my hand, which actually go with the films in the Genesis series. I'm Trey Smith of God in a Nutshell. God bless every last one of you, every last one of you and your families on the other side of the screen.